Welcome back, everybody, to another session of the Antigua Public Library's Entrepreneurship and Empowerment Series. And today we have with us Mr. Colin John Jenkins, who is a sustainable development consultant. Hello, Mr. John Jenkins. How are you today? How are you doing, Miss Thomas? I'm great. I just had lunch. <laughs> I'm glad you got the opportunity to have lunch. I know that this generally takes up most people's lunch hour and, you know, I'm glad that you were able to fit us in because I can see from your resume, you are a very busy man. Ah, uh, yes, I try to be. The devil find <laughs> things for idle hands to do. <laughs> well, wow. as I tell the students all the time, if you don't make anything, you make mischief. So yeah, I guess that works out. So you are an architect by training. How did you get into architecture? But first, what is architecture? Essentially, architecture is the design of spaces and buildings that we use and occupy. Um, so it's the science that goes into it. Uh, and it's just not drawing two lines and building two blocks together. There's, there's a lot of thought that goes into how we make spaces uh, efficient and effective for persons to use, to live, to function, to be inspired. When you think about it, going right back to Egypt, all that is architecture. So there's always sure. been a consciousness and a reflection of human society and its development and its intellect over time. Um, I got into architecture quite interestingly because at first I wanted to be a scientist growing up. I used to experiment a lot. Um, with different animals and chemicals. And I will always had this fondness for science, but I also liked art as well too. Um, somewhere along the line, uh, I realized that being a scientist may not necessarily pay the bills as much as I would like in Antigua and Barbuda. <laughs> mm. So I switched to something else that I had enjoyed and was curious and inquisitive about. That is how buildings work how they function, why some places capture the imaginations the way they do. And I got into architecture, which seemed to be more of an um, efficient way to go, e economically speaking, <laughs> later on in life. Nice. I mean, when we think of architecture, most people will think of, you know, grand museums and, you know, Roman architecture and all of these things. If we think of architecture at all, I don't think very many people consider just our buildings that we live in as a part of architecture. I guess mm -hmm. that's probably because most persons would be thinking architecture is uh, the like styles of architecture. If mm -hmm. you could sum up Antigua's architectural style, what would it be? There are two, well, there are three predominant styles that makes Antigua unique. And it had to do, of course, with how we developed and due to our colonial masters. So there's Victorian, Georgian, and naval architecture. The naval architecture you tend to see around the different um, shorelines and some of the areas like English Harbor and Shirley Heights mm -hmm. and Fort James, where there was the a port, basically. Yeah, there was a defense strategy along the lines of protecting Antigua, which is resource. Of course, it was one, a very valuable back then and the, the amount of inlets and ports that we had. So there was a military fortifications and they came along from our colonizers, which were like Europe, um, primarily the UK. Uh, and mm -hmm. then of course, we, 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 we captured a lot of their styles too. So the Georgian and Victorian, you'd see them in St. John's with the, the triple wolf being very prominent. Um, mm. Triple gable, like they look like A's like this, three of them, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. And then we have okay. the, the Georgian, when you're talking about um, the other styles uh, in relation to uh, the hip wolves that you see with the extended patios and so on. So we generally get our styles from our colonial masters. Um, we didn't bring over our architecture from Africa, unfortunately, because you know how terrible that story was. Um, mm -hmm. So those are generally our three styles. And of course, as time would have gone on, there were certain influences that then change how architecture mm -hmm. was understood and interpreted. Mm -hmm. Cool. So once you would have decided, okay, architecture it is, 
what school did you decide on when you were picking and how long did that take to become certified? Okay. Um, when uh, I made a decision to, to look into architecture seriously was when I was in secondary school. So by the time I got to third form, I had made a decision that that's where I was going. Nice. So I did CXEs to match the sort of subjects that I think I was going to need, the science subjects, the technical and building technology when I taught this comprehensive school. Oh, From there, nice. um, the, the architecture school scholarships weren't really that prominent because you're talking mm -hmm. about 1997. Yes, I'm kind of old. Um, and I decided <laughs> to, to not go to state college, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. I spent years in Antigua and Barbuda, Defense Force, working to gain some, some income and save that so I could pay tuition to go to college, maybe, you know, Jamaica or maybe Trinidad or somewhere in the United mm -hmm. States. And, and it so happened that luck would have it. The Cuban scholarship had opened up and I applied and then I left from Defense Force and went to Cuba to study architecture. I was there for six years. So the first year, you basically do A-levels in Spanish, so they get you oriented mm -hmm. with the language and the intensity, and then you move on from there to do five years of, of your career, which is a professional degree. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that is exactly what happened. But interestingly enough, architecture is the only career in Cuba that you have to do an entrance exam for. So they have cybernetics, informatics, pure math, civil engineering, structural engineering, mechanical engineering, wow. psychology, law, sports, um, pharmacy, medicine, you name it. Because Cuba is big on education. Eh? It's one of the highest yeah. literacy. Right. So literacy in Cuba is, can't even talk about that. Uh, and, but architecture is the only subject of a career <laughs> path that you have to do an entrance exam for. What were they testing for? They test your your attitude for the for the for the subject. Mm -hmm. You have to remember, and I don't think we, we pay a lot of importance to it here. Mm -hmm. You have to remember that these people who are architects, they they are essentially the painters of the canvas of how society looks and feels. So if you have persons yes. who are poor at designing, it's reflected in the structures the infrastructure, the buildings, you see it. Um, mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with the size of the country. Yeah? The, the actual land um, area of the country, no, because you have places that, like Singapore, that's different than us. Economics has a lot to do with it, but the creativity and the appreciation for that goes a long way. So with this entrance exam, <laughs> they give you four hours and... The teacher came in the classroom, very interesting story. And of course, all, all of this is in Spanish, eh? no English whatsoever. So she came in the wow. classroom and said, I'm not gonna say what she said in Spanish because your audience may not understand, but she basically <laughs> said, imagine you're coming into the country in an airplane, draw what you see. That's the first question. Wow. Then she asks you, um, um, the, I'm going to give you six boxes with various lines and design. Create something using these lines to then finish and make a pattern that's related to architecture. So you might see an S like that or two mm -hmm. lines that cross like that. You have to take those lines and then finish something up. And then with us, us, without us knowing, she walked out to the classroom and then came back in. And when she came back in, she said, there was a chair right where I was. Mm -hmm. I want you to draw the chair. And the chair, she took it outside, you know. Whoa. <laughs> but it's only when she came back in, she told us that the chair that I took outside, draw it in its position. And so they, they yeah. test to see if you have the ability to see things um, created before you even start creating it. So you have to have mm -hmm. foresight. Good architects are philosophers. Um, they're big on sociology. Uh, and they have foresight. So that was the extent of the exam. So if you fail the exam, you're not admitted to the program. You have to do civil engineering instead or mechanical or industrial engineering, but you're not admitted to architecture. 
How is civil engineering related to architecture? That's a great question. So I'll use an example um, of the human anatomy. So imagine all that you've seen here, all of this beautiful face and ears and bright white teeth. All of this, <laughs> all of this is, is the architecture of the human anatomy, the this, mm -hmm. the, the, the mm -hmm. form, right? Mm -hmm. And the engineers, they deal with what's inside. So the bone structures, oh. the, the symmetry of where your joints are, the, uh, the articulations. So, so they deal with the, the bone structure. We deal with the outer appearance in the flesh. So we may have this. Okay, this is what I like to look like. And they say, okay, this is how you accomplish it physically on the internal side. So we work as a team and they provide the structural calculations to make whatever you are thinking about in terms of the design work. Because you don't always design something that works. And at times they have to sort of bring it in to say, look, you know, it's, it's hanging off too far. It will break mm -hmm. unless we do X, yeah. Y, and Z. Right. So it's, it's a, a complete package. And I'm, I use the human body as a great example a lot because the civil and structural engineers deal with the, the structural integrity and resistance mm -hmm. of the body to, to support its stresses. Mm -hmm. But they have other sorts of engineers too, the mechanical, the, the electrical, the plumbers, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. And they deal now with your circulation systems, the waste systems, your mm -hmm. purification system. So when you think about a human body, that is why they like to say the architecture itself is a reflection of the natural environment, right? Because the, the buildings in them have to function as such. They just can't move like that, but they function in the same way. True. So, they, so basically, you are giving form over their function. It, in a way, yes, because we also design with function in mind. Mm. Form and function. There's always a debate among architects um, <laughs> with form and function. But in terms of function, the engineers ensure that function you're thinking about works. Because mm -hmm. yeah. I see you have, um, you talk about green design and wellness design. So it, that's a part of the whole function within the creation of the form. Yes, uh, but that is not something that is automatically applied to architecture because these are now specific areas that you can get into. Some architects, um, they are big on uh, landscaping. Some mm -hmm. are more modernist, some are more structurally oriented. The, the whole aspect, uh, aspect of sustainable approach, that was something that I got curious and passionate about over the years. So I complemented my 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 degree programs with, with that accreditation. Okay. So how does the design of the building really affect you? Because you don't really think about it a lot, I suppose, as most persons. But I mean, when you are inside of a building, all of these things come together to determine how you feel when you're in there, how mm -hmm. easy it is to keep it hot, how easy it is to keep it cold whether you mm -hmm. have good airflow going through. Because I can think of some buildings that I've been into and I felt like I was suffocating. Yeah, yeah. And so I suppose that that is, that, that is a very important part, you know, how good do people feel inside of these buildings? Are these buildings creating issues for persons' individual health? And also, how is my construction impacting the nature around the area that I am building in. It How sounds important like I'm interviewing you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a librarian. I like to read. And recently yeah. I decided I I'm going to build my own home, which was, <laughs> which is, it was fun because right. I, I like to be very hands-on. So I like to know, you know, what I expected. So I went to, and a draftsman basically I said to him, listen, this is what I want. I already drew it. I'm like, this is what I want. I just need you to make it legal. And he looked at me and he's like, why have you done this? But I had to think about it because I, I know the area. 
I know what it's like when heavy rain falls. So I had mm-hmm. to tell him all. I told him all of these things because in my mind, constructing all of these things need to be born, born out in design, you know, because mm-hmm. I had a friend who told me, you know, he's an engineer. He's like, oh, you have to get soil tests and all of these things, which I still haven't. I don't even know how all of that goes. I just went, this is what I want to have done and this is what we're doing. But do you find that locals, as they're constructing things, really bear these things in mind? Are they thinking, I need my house to make a statement or I need for it to fit into the environment? Or are they just like, I need four bedrooms, two bathrooms, and whatever you do, it works. <laughs> is it is an what interesting do- what do we uh, like as a people? I would definitely say that the career needs more awareness. It, it does. Mm. Um, we tend to think of things job, budget driven and nothing else mm-hmm. um, on the immediate side. And long term, we then understand that perhaps we didn't make the best decisions that we should have. Mm-hmm. Uh, you made some comments earlier, which I think hit the spot. You can have the same size room and have many different variations. And when you step in the room, you have certain sentiments and feelings and emotions that are provoked because of that. So that is why, for example, the height of the rooms is important depending on what you're doing, the geometry of the room, the the contents of the room and how they are oriented even the colors and the lighting is, you know, the lighting is a big deal because you, you are, you are animal that is guided or governed by something they call a circadian rhythms. Mm-hmm. And circadian rhythms really is a regulation of human function and performance based on lighting. Mm-hmm. So, um, and lighting that has to do with when you rest, when you work, when you're working, when are you optimum peak hours for certain things. So we bear all of these things in mind. Um, The regular person may not understand it. Of course, five years of study just to get it is is quite some time to put on a lot of information. You think about it. Um, So we have to sensitize persons. You would know, you know, sometimes you're driving on the road and you can say, you know, that house, that looks like an architect did that house. Because it, it... there's something that tells you a lot of thought went into it. It's different. It seems pure, to use a word. Mm-hmm. And so you realize that there's a difference with how it's approached. And it even more comes home when you travel. If you've ever left Antigua and went mm-hmm. to any first world country and you walk around, you say, okay, all right, I get it. <laughs> And then you come yeah, back but- home, you're like, okay. But yeah. I will say, um, I think the challenge is a lot. Persons, and, and rightly so, I, I understand. Don't get, don't get me wrong, I understand. Persons mm-hmm. may think twice about paying an architect to do something that they think is small. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they go to other persons who are less expensive. Um, it does not take away from that person who's less expensive. Maybe the person is not talented. They're talented enough to do something really good. Mm-hmm. But on average, when you when you go so long to study, to put a lot of thought into these things, um, persons may not want to compensate you for it. And so part of that reluctance may be that they, they may not quite understand how many things you need to consider or why it is that our consultancy may be something that they would think twice about engaging. Um, but you, as like I said, but when you do see it, you know, okay, all right, now I understand, understand I get it because I walk into this space and it just like if it's speaking to me, it says something or I get home and I don't want to leave because yeah. the windows are in the right place because the person thought about circulation the house is oriented properly so it's not heating up as fast. When hurricanes are coming, you're not worried because it, you had the confidence that the person and the engineer involved knew what they were doing. You generally don't have the same set of issues from persons who would not use a professional 
or someone who knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So awareness is required. How do you think, how could we bring more awareness to this, do you think? Oh, oh, oh. Um, <laughs> let me tell you, when I, when I got out of school, this is, another, this is another interesting conversation. When I got out of university and I, mm -hmm. I used to talk to some of my colleagues and I said, you know, I don't find that architects do a lot of writing in publications here, mm. right? Um, and I get it. Sometimes our environment can be one <laughs> that mm. you're trying to do something good, for instance, mm. and there's this one client that things didn't work out well with, mm. and that client felt feels as if they have to say, okay, this person is not good, don't use them, and it becomes... <laughs> It becomes a thing instead yeah. of looking at what the person is trying to accomplish. So I think some mm. people deserve, they're like, okay, if you want need an architect, I'm here, but I'm not going to put myself forward like that. But I'm not quite like that because I realize mm. part of the discussion, for good or for bad, is to get people involved in the conversation. So when I got back from university, I had a little social experiment that I planned. Mm. And for, for <laughs> when did I start? About seven, about, about seven, eight years now. Every day, Saturday and Sunday included, mm -hmm. for about seven to eight years. Let me repeat. Every day, Saturday and Sunday included, for about seven years. That's a lot. I, mm. I posted an image on social media. Mm that has something to do with architecture. So it could be a house, it could be a pool, a bathroom, landscaping, it didn't matter. Mm. And I use different cop captions, I would say, do you like this? What you don't like about this? How do you feel about this? How much do you rate this? And without writing, because you see sometimes architects, like I mentioned, are philosophers. So when they start getting into form and functions and understanding the symmetric areas that you have to consider and the facade and having a French influence or neoclassical, you start to lose people. Mm -hmm. Because I did who knows what neoclassical means? Right. So I did a different approach by just showing people images that because people respond mm -hmm. to images. True. And over the years, I have personally found that people begot, be, became more aware as to what to expect. So, and also what you want, because sometimes you don't know what you want until you see somebody else with it. I mean, how many times have you gone to a restaurant and somebody else's food come out and you go, crap, I should have ordered that. Yeah, I, I've gotten that. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, I posted, I posted a lot of images and at first it was, you know, people didn't respond that much a one like two like no is big conversation mm. big 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 conversation about the too much clutter or the colors are great or uh, yeah they definitely can deal with this and it's it's a lot more awareness now and in between mm. i would post my actual work showing persons how i move from a concept to a finished product so i think there's a lot more awareness now because there's a lot more people interconnected by social media and I just don't use, use Facebook alone. I hit it on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and Facebook. All four. So I bombard my, my page with works. And I, I, like I said, eventually people got it. People got it. I remember one time I was, I was sitting down and... Facebook sent me a message. Broom, congratulations. I was like, congratulations. And I said, yes, congratulations. You've posted 695 or six times consecutively on Facebook. So for 690 something days without miss. That's a, that's a lot. Yeah. I tend to be <laughs> a person that's very determined. So I, I, I apply can, I can see that discipline. I apply that discipline to other parts of my life as well. So it's, it's training, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, because it's, it's a lot. It's 
just looking just from the architectural standpoint alone, that's that's a lot of work. And I think as a people, we don't even recognize because when I decided that, you know, I'm going to need a house, I started asking questions of the persons around me. But most of my friends don't own any homes. They rent and stuff like that. So I tried to act. And it's like, oh, no, I don't need an architect, man. I know a man that can draw a plan. And I'm just like, <laughs> uh, I'm like, yeah. Because the first person that I actually went to, he was like, so what are you looking for? Like a two-bedroom, three-bedroom, four-bedroom. He had, like, plans already drawn. And if you look around Antigua, sometimes you realize there are a lot of, it's like copy and paste. It's like this house is just that house in blue. This house is that house in green. It's basically there's a square house with a porch with the um, what do you call that? A gable roof. That's the one with the the all flat sides, all four sides are like to the point in the middle. The hip roof, right? So you have that. You have the rectangle with the one in front, with the porch off to the side. And then you have the house that is, somebody got artistic and they make a little design on the front gallery. But basically, as you're looking around, that's what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. This is the house, the template that I have noted around the place. So I think it's, it's sad really, because at this point, I would have gone through the entire process. I would have had to sat down and think it all through for myself. When what I'm realizing now is I really needed to just consult an architect. Not necessarily. Because, I mean, the things that I wanted, it, it all would end up being basically the same. It's a square or a rectangle. I have no problem with different shapes. I want it to fit in with, you know, but most of the persons who I would have spoken to, they're only very comfortable drawing, giving me a square or a rectangle or, you know, whatever it is. And they would also talk to you about the cost involved with changing anything in the design, which is another issue that, you know, would have been encountered. And I'm just thinking, had I known to ask, then perhaps I would have chosen a different design altogether. Mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. the thing is, which I think is important to note here, um, in our profession, the whole ambit of the, 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 the design um, world, they are architects, they are technicians, they are technologists, they are draftsmen and draftswomen, right? Mm. They are designers as well. Different mm. levels have different expectations and different requirements. Again, I've known some designers who are not architects that are really talented. Mm. And, um, and so why I mention not necessarily going to an architect to do your home Mm -hmm. um, the laws of Antigua and Barbuda allows for persons who are not architects to design structures that are not large, right? So you can have designers or technicians or draftsmen who can design something really nice for you. Um, but the, the, the idea here is that the person is talented or at least knows what they're doing. That's what I'm suggesting mm -hmm. to you. So not necessarily you had to come to an architect, no, because... Even in a lot of the firms that are in the Caribbean, mm. all architects are not working in the office. We may be the ones to, to create the general idea and conceptualize and deal with the client because we are mm. trained as well to do that, like putting contracts together and understanding client and, and, and consultant um, responsibilities, managing the overall project, being responsible legally for the overall project and so on. But there are technicians that when you design that first concept and you give it to them, they can, they can take just the sketch in the paper and develop everything. So it's, it's very, very important to understand that um, you don't necessarily have situations where all architects are always working in all of the offices. No, it doesn't work mm -hmm. like that. But how do you know who, do you, who you need and where to find them. And also, as you're saying, the laws of Antigua allow for, you know, buildings of a certain size. They don't necessarily require an architect, but is there a governing body for architects in Antigua? Yes, there is. There's two. Well, let me let me retract that statement. 
There, there's, a re, there's a governing body, but what they call that body is the Council of Architects of Antigua and Barbuda, right? Mm -hmm. And that is essentially the government mandated arm of, of the profession that deals with registration, right? So they, they deal with the, 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 the implementation of the law in relation to architecture. So mm -hmm. like a person like me, I have I have lifetime registration now because once you apply and you meet the criteria, you get registered for life. However, in order for me to retain my practice, I have to get a license every year. And part of that licensing requirement is I have to take out something they call professional indemnity insurance. So I have to be covered by insurance to practice. In other words, if I screw up, you have legal redress, right? So, so you, you get to now see that there's a layer of, of more advanced operations here than just being a college draftsman, right? Mm. Um, the laws have changed recently. So draftspersons, technicians, technologists, they're as well, they're forming their own associations and they're guided by their regulations as well. So there's a council of architects and then there's an institute of architects which deals like the promotion of the profession, continual education, um, awareness and so on. So it's almost like you have a legal body that certifies persons, regulate like license and they have they're like the association of these with regular functions and events and training and such. And so I don't think it's that much different with other professions, you know, like the bar, mm -hmm. the bar registers, um, are, people are called to the bar to become attorneys. And then of course you have different clubs or associations after the accountants have something similar. There's a medical board. So it's not outside of the practice of professional organizations in Antigua. Is it really the same thing? Cool. I didn't even know, <laughs> I didn't know they existed. Actually, because yeah. I mean, there, there are so many things that happen in the Carib in in the islands, in the region that you just you don't have any knowledge of. If you're not really interested and you're not paying attention, many things will miss you. And as we're having this conversation, I'm realizing that I need to create a, gu a resource guide for the library as it pertains to architecture, because we don't have one telling you where to go and what you need to know and who you can get information from and things like that. There's a website it, for the Council of Architects the, as well. The, the, oh, the they have a website? The Institute has a website. Okay. The Institute I'll has get, a website. I'll get that information from you and try and link it below this video so that others who are looking can find it. But in addition to being an architect, I see that you are the co-founder of CJC and Associates. What's that about? CJC Plus Associates Inc. Mm -hmm. So it's a sustainable development company, like a building development company consultancy. Mm -hmm. um, and when I mention building development company, I have to smile because there are three partners, but between the three partners, we cover so many ambits or arms of the profession mm -hmm. that it's a lot. So we, 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 we pretty much offer an all-inclusive uh, consultancy package. So um, we, we offer architecture, mm -hmm. interior designing, um, project management, construction management, quantity surveying, green building consultancy, well building consultancy. Yeah. As in wells for water? No, well as in, well oh. is <laughs> health you and wellness. well building. I'm like, we're building wells? <laughs> no, health, health and wellness, really. Um, for example, uh, in, in recently after the whole movement with climate change, they also recognized that it was important to focus on metrics or rating systems that dealt with um, the interior of the buildings with particular focus for the occupants of the buildings. Mm -hmm. So they looked at seven dimensions, lighting, fitness, comfort, mind, nutrition, and so on. So all air quality, so all these came into play. Um, so I, I, again, curious, went to the United States, 
got the training, did a, a very rigorous examination. So rigorous that I decided I'm not going back to do any more examinations again. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was successful and um, I became the first person in the Caribbean from Cuba to Venezuela with the accreditation. So I am quote unquote a specialist in advising persons how to look at their building in terms of health and wellness dimensions that would be important for the building occupants. And a year after, here comes COVID-19. Oh dear. <laughs> meaning, meaning that people now had to sit back and look at health and wellness in a different dimension. Yeah. Right? How many people are in a room? How does that affect airflow and air quality? All of these things. Exactly. So all of these things I was studying, I was like, look at that. It's now a global thing, you know? Mm -hmm. In an unfortunate way, though, but that does, yeah. So, so apart from green buildings, that became another thing. So we just added to the complement of what we have existing already. So you, you could once it's building, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot that we offer as a company. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I see you also lecture at U. Yes, project management at the Open Campus. Interesting. Yep. Mm -hmm. How are you enjoying they, teaching that? According to my students, I'm very good at it. That's that's I, to the end of the course. At the beginning, <laughs> they think I'm the devil incarnate, but <laughs> but that's I mean, just how it is. Is that is that an end? Is it attached to another course, or can you just literally just take a, do a course in project management? No, it's not, it's not attached to anything else. You do a oh. certification in project management that's backed by the University of the West Indies. Sounds like something I should do. Mm, it's very affordable. It's a, so, from last I heard, it's about $650 easy for 10 weeks. Yeah. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. What has been for you the most memorable project that you've worked on? The Antigua and Barbuda Interpretation Center in Christian Valley. It's about to be opened in uh, June. Mm -hmm. um, I designed the building a few years ago, um, and uh, there were some challenges to start be under control of the client, which is the Department of Environment. Mm -hmm. But we eventually got it to get off the ground. Um, and I'm really excited about it opening. Um, it's, it's located at the base of Boggy Peak, but um, why, what, what is so important about this building to me personally mm. it is about showing persons what can be accomplished when we really put our minds to it um, and showing persons how far you can get irrespective of where you started off from in, in life. I'll get back to that because I have to explain that. Uh, and but last but not least, it's it's going to be Antigua and Barbuda's first um, United States Green Building Council shot sanctioned green building. So in other words, it has mm -hmm. an international recognition to it that will be going on the United States database to say that Antigua and Barbuda has a lead certified building. LEAD is an acronym for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. So it's going to be a public building. So you can come there, look around it. They, they would, um, from my understanding, they would allow persons with a certain understanding and I think an arrangement, a business arrangement, to use the facility. But it's to enhance biodiversity and awareness for the natural environment. So it's, it has a lot. Of, it's going to be run by solar panels. It has a lot of features in it that speaks to green building and that approach. So it has to, to be involved in that, to be the person to conceptualize that and get it to that level in terms of design and then applying and getting that recognition for it. I, I really feel happy about it. It's really going to put Antigua Barbuda on the map. So yeah, I look I, forward to seeing it. Yeah, yeah. That's that. It sounds. It sounds amazing. I'm looking forward to seeing it because you hear all the time about green buildings and all of these things. When, when you get there, 
we you have see. an idea in our mind that that is other people's thing and it's over there and it's out there. So having it here, it's something I'm really looking forward to seeing. But I noticed you also talk about professional mentorship. Tell us about that. Well, I grew up in, 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 in Hutton. Some people say Grace Farm, but we say Hutton. Mm -hmm. And the neighborhood back then was pretty rough. I think it's still rough to this day, right? Um, mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you can't become something um, that people would aspire to in life. And I always try and preach that, right? Um, part of the reason why I am where I am has to do with positive role models in my life. And so I understood very early that it's important to try and um, spend not a huge amount because we all have our daily duties to do, but spend time with those who show an interest to help guide them. And so over the years, um, even though I'm in a profession, if there's someone younger in the profession that I can help, I help them. I don't see them as competition. I have my style, my personality, my ways. Clients choose who they wish for various reasons. Mm -hmm. But I've always seen it as if you're successful, then I'm successful because the economy works as such. If you're successful, you spend when you spend, someone earns, they spend, and before you know it, that money circles right back to you, right? So the more successful people are, the better it is for us. So I've mentored a lot of young people in terms of coming up throughout the ranks in the profession, and sometimes slightly outside of the profession. I would get calls from, believe it or not, Trinidad and even Barbados, because they see what I'm doing on LinkedIn, uh, and I share my work a lot share my philosophy, share certain thoughts and articles and so on. And they reach out to me and ask for advice. And I share it willingly and openly. So there's empowered a lot of people to, to get ahead. Um, if I went to the river, thought the river was not deep and fell in the river, the idea is when you come behind of me to tell you, you should drop in the river like me to learn the lesson. And that has been my philosophy. It's, it's heartening to hear because a lot of times persons are considering other persons as their competition. It's like a zero-sum game. If you win, I have to lose. And the truth of the matter is all of us benefit because it means that we have to compete with each other. True. But it pushes us to become better versions of ourselves and to keep up to date and keep producing a good product that you know everybody can benefit from. So I, I'm very happy to hear that you're helping future generations and other persons within your particular niche industry to find themselves, so to speak. It's I important. see also that you talk you you talk about um, male empowerment, social work. Mm -hmm. Is that also related to the mentorship or is this something else altogether? And how does that look for you? So that's a funny story. <laughs> I have a lot of funny stories. <laughs> um, I, I have a very good friend of mine who is a feminist. Um, her name is Zara Ewell. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, it's a bunch of them that I'm around. Zara Ewell. <laughs> Lenisa George, Marcella Andre, Fiola Hardin, Floyd Williams. Uh, they, listen, maybe I should stop calling names so I don't forget <laughs> anybody. But um, we, we've been friends, especially myself and Zara, for a very long time. And Zara is pa passionate about um, teaching, pedagogy, and feminism as well too, and mentorship. She, she's been there for a lot of young ladies and young men in, in, in our society. Um, but particularly and unfortunately, uh, I think it was close to about 10 years ago. It was about that. There were a series of rapes taking place in Antigua and they were happening in rapid succession. It was almost like if we had a serial rapist in Antigua. So a lot of women were very scared and and the 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 
the ladies came together, her Zara, Tamazine, Gresham, and Lenisa, they created an organization called Women of Antigua. And they decided to put on a, a stage play called Vagina Monologues. Mm. And, and unlike the name, it was really about stories of women, um, or stories of women who went through things that potentially change their lives forever. Traumatic experience, um, things, issues of abuse, being a mother, single parent, um, harassment, you name it. And so my wife at the time um, became a member of the cast. So she did a particular part of it. Mm. And, and in helping her going, uh, going to the studio ever so often, and then actually the night of the show, mm. I sat there and I listened to the plight in a way that was delivered by performing arts. And performing arts, just like you're watching a movie, can be a very powerful instrument to get a point across. Mm. And I said, you know what? I'm a man, but I feel terrible. Because I saw one common factor here is that men were at the root of it. It's not that all men are bad, you know, but mm -hmm. what I was hearing is issues that eventually got down to how we behave as men. And there are multifaceted reasons why that is. So after that, I said, you know, in my small way, I wanted to do something. So I got the collaboration of some men that I know, some I did not know at the time. And I asked them if they're interested in us doing a project. Now, mm -hmm. my first thought was to do a version of the, the vagina monologues called the penis monologue. I... <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I said, you know, that, that might be a little troublesome because it might be looking like you're competing. And the idea is not to compete. Yes. So it I left might it. come off looking tit for tat. Yeah. So I, I left it alone. And interestingly, the year after, someone in Trinidad did one. Mm. And they call it the same thing. So, <laughs> they were like, so they were like, you see, you should have done it, but... We, we instead, we started to look at something called International Men's Day, mm. which is celebrated November the 9th. And it's about issues that boys and men face in society that generally gets overlooked. Homelessness, um, suicide rates, paternity, father, father, fatherhood, mentorship, you name it. Mm. And um, from since about 2012 until recently, We've been every around the, the period of internal Men's Day, we would do things to sort of heighten the awareness as to what the day meant. Mm -hmm. And um, we did YouTube videos speaking. You just imagine you have 11 men in Antigua on YouTube talking about things such as men and health, men and mentorship, social misconceptions, depression. We don't generally do that here. No. Manage to put it generally do that in private, much less in public. So, so we, we pulled it off, we put it out there, and it for most parts it got really good feedback. Hmm. But an interesting thing happened in the preparation leading up to the event. Hmm. We decided that we we're going to meet and discuss these matters by my home. So, everybody was sitting in the living room and said, Okay, guys. Here are 10 things that, according to this article, the media glosses over when it comes to men. What, which one you think you're passionate about? And we start talking. And while we're talking, guys gave personal experiences that they had that explain why it is that they're serious about this. Mm -hmm. And it became a therapy session. So over the period of months when we were doing this, because we had to really try and narrow down what we're going to say, not to have a spin-off where persons um, take away from, we're trying to get a mess. We want you to focus on the message mm -hmm. and not so much the political correctness of everything we say. Try mm -hmm. and focus on what we're trying to say here. And the message was from men to men, by men. Because you, you may not get the guys in a forum to sit down and talk, but if they're behind the computer or their phone, they might just listen. 
So we set it out there. And it became a therapy session. And when we finished the initiative, the guys that were involved said they don't think we should stop. We should continue. So ever so often when someone is going through some challenges, we would call everyone and we sit down and we talk about it. Now, it wasn't just me in terms of my age group and stuff like that. We had younger men. We had men that even had grandchildren. So you had uh, some guys that are working, some are in marriage, some are divorced, some are single. So you had this, this holistic perspective of a view, to, of views to a particular issue. Mm -hmm. And what that offered is um, real feedback. So if there's an issue, you get feedback from different perspectives. So it makes you think. Mm -hmm. And I've seen men, um, become better versions of themselves through that experience. Even me, I got, I got something from it. And, mm -hmm. and the hope was to tell people about it, not so that they come and join, but so that they replicated what we did in their sphere, in their communities, in their connections, in their networks. Because my living room is only so big. I know bigger. I feel, I feel terrible to say I've never heard of this. I know. <laughs> I've never, I've never heard of this at all. I've heard about the vagina monologues, and I've heard about all of the other um, things that Zara and the others would have been doing, but I have, I haven't heard of this at all for men, mm -hmm. and I find it very interesting because a lot of times, as as a librarian, you meet all kinds of people from all kinds of places, and sometimes they have issues, and I find that some of them would tend to come and sit and talk to me. And some of them are guys, and I know that my, my view on things may be biased because I'm a woman, but I have no idea who to you know, send you to talk to or if you wanted you know, another male's perspective on it. It never crossed my mind, and, and it never crossed my social media either. The videos are on YouTube on the Male Empowerment Network. So they're, they're still there. There are about 10 videos or so. Um, mm -hmm. Newspapers have covered the group before. I've done a lot of interviews on ABS and Observer Radio as well. But it, like I said, it generally comes around or picks up steam around International Men's Day. Um, but yeah, we've been around a long time. I think the first time we supposed to start talking about Men's Day was, was in 2012. So I guess it just, you were just in your books, that's all. <laughs> or maybe I wasn't in the country. It's also possible I wasn't physically here at the time when, when it was going on. That's right. Oh, wow. It's been a wonderful interview. It's been a long interview. Usually we're only half an hour. But uh -huh. it's it's almost been an hour, and I feel like there's so many other things that we could do. Right? Yeah, I feel like there's so many things. I think that that this particular, in particular, the male empowerment work is something that we would love to have you back to talk about again. Perhaps maybe you and a few of the others from your original group may want to have a discussion with us on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can ask. I'm, I mean, we have to try and fit within people's lunch hour because soon people are going to have to go and, you know, we want to keep it tight within that lunch hour period for persons. But I just want to say it's it's been wonderful having you. You've been an awesome guest and you've opened my eyes to a lot of things, not just in architecture and, and building design. I'm sure now every time I walk into a building, I'm going to think to myself, how do I feel? Is this lighting good? You know, what's going on in this space? What would I like to keep? What would I want to change? And I'm very appreciative for that, that you've given us today. So thank you very much, Colin, for coming and talking to us. Pleasure is all mine. Pleasure is all mine. <laughs> Next week, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have with us Miss Dorothea Nelson, educator, librarian extraordinaire. So please come by and visit with us again. This has been your... Career and Entrepreneurship Tips and Tricks with Alicia Thomas from the National Public Library. Bye, everybody. Oh, it looks like we're still live.